Guten Morgen, meine Freunde, and welcome to the series where we look askance at history and history looks askance right back at us. This week, the time tunnel takes us up to the week ending on Australia Day, January 26, 1989, in this latest episode of The Past is a Foreign Country. Number 10, up from number 12 last week for its lone week in the top 10 is Put a Little Love in Your Heart by Al Green and Annie Lennox. It's the right song, written by our old friend Jackie DeShannon. It's wonderful to hear Al Green back after all these years. Was Green the most underrated of the classic soul singers? But Annie Lennox seems pretty anonymous in the arrangement and production is what could only be described as extremely 1989. And it's overlong and drawn out. Still, Al Green, what a voice. Steady at number nine is Poison with Every Rose Has Its Thorn. Very possibly the greatest ever glam metal power ballad whatnot ever. I have no idea. I find the song excruciatingly boring. The one thing no song with the word glam in its descriptors should ever be. Did you know the term power ballad was first coined in 1974 by Lester Bangs to describe the music of Barry Manilow? It would seem the rest of the country came rapidly to the same opinion as I, as this song plunged at the number 20 next week. In at number 8 we have another record which I find a tedious and pointless metal as anything's cover of Chuck Berry's rock and roll music. I know that the song was cut for a hit movie and that every band has an inalienable right to a payday, but I think this just illustrates that we, as a just and responsible community of top 40 curators, should have given Mental as Anything that payday for some of their great work of the late 70s, early 80s, rather than for this banal and boring effort. This record is symptomatic of what we'll call Greedy's years, where keyboardist Greedy Smith became the dominant personality in the group after writing the huge hit Live It Up in 1985, and the band became less quirky and more predictable. Now that's not a diss on Greedy Smith, who was a lovely, lovely chap, but he just projected a certain bonhomie that was at odds with the art schooly image that the band had previously had. It's good to reflect though that after many years in the wilderness, the group finally realized that Quirky was what they did best and went back to celebrating that. Greedy Smith, so named because he once ate 15 pieces of a Kentucky Fried Chicken on stage one night at a gig, sadly passed away in late 2019. One final piece of mental as anything trivia, Adjusting for time difference, Metal as Anything were actually the first band in the world to appear on Live Aid, opening up the Oz for Africa concerts which were headlined by NXS. The highest debutante in this week's top 10 is The Tuneful She Makes My Day by the perennially well-dressed Robert Palmer. A really well-crafted and arranged song, like quite a few records this week, this was as good as it got from She Makes My Day, which is a pity because it was one of the better songs on the chart this week. It was also the perfect follow-up to his mega-hit, Simply Irresistible. Speaking of Simply Irresistible, which was the 28th biggest hit of all time from 1958 to 1989, we come to the 27th biggest hit. Does anyone want to have a guess at what the 26th biggest hit was? It was Waterloo by ABBA. I'm Gonna Be 500 Miles by The Proclaimers. Written, so they say, while waiting for a bus to take a group of Hibernian football club supporters to a game in Aberdeen, even though that's only a 250 mile round trip, I find the record a little bland and facile, but there's a whole band of 30-somethings now who were born in the wake of punk rock for whom this song is a waypoint of adolescence. So, let's visit the fun-filled fiesta of Fowl's Fabulous World of Facts for this week. Ups and downs first, the biggest booster was Ian Moss's catchy Tucker's Daughter, which came straight in at number 12 and zigzagged its way up to number one by the second week of March and tumbling back down the charts came the mawkish Since I Love You by Barbara Streisand and Don Johnson. New to the charts and of some cultural significance were Copperhead Road by Steve Earle and the frankly tedious Orinoco Flow by Enya. Off the charts were Punk Bubblegum Lightweight's Transvision Vamp with I Want Your Love, a song as imaginative as the title implies. Unbelievably, they had another even bigger hit with the only marginally more creatively titled Baby I Don't Care. Number one hits in the US and UK respectively were the utterly forgettable Two Hearts by the person we wish we could utterly forget, Phil Collins, and Something's Gotten Hold of My Heart, written by the two Rogers from last week. Cook and Greenaway for Mark Armand and his 1967 hitmaker, Gene Pitney, which was a very memorable effort indeed. 
and the number one album in town was the soundtrack to the Tom Cruise Magnum Opus Cocktail, a compilation of blinding corporate blanditudes with the sole and frankly mind-boggling exception of the wonderful, powerful stuff by the fabulous Thunderbirds. Well now, at number 5 is the only song we've ever had in this series that actually drove the super secret scoring algorithm's value down. I'm always talking about great Australian bands that the world never got a chance to hear from. Well, here's an awful, awful band that the world thankfully never got to hear from. 1927 and this their second hit, If I Could. 1927 played a brand of amateurish wuss rock that sounded like it was written in a 15 year old's bedroom, practiced in a garage and then recorded at a suburban studio in an industrial park on someone's uncle's dime. So basically they were Powderfinger. Horrid stuff, and if any of you last more than 45 seconds with it on the playlist before clicking forward or falling asleep, you're better than me. In at number four is the duet we all wanted but didn't deserve, especially for you, which pitted the preternatural loveliness and growing vocal confidence of Kylie Minogue with the in always less impressive Jason Donovan. It's a pleasant enough song, the drums tend to be way too intrusive, but at least they aren't patented 80s gated snares. I'm looking at you, Phil Collins. And I always found the video made me laugh. Kylie wrapping her arm around Jason Donovan's neck, Kylie being at least nine inches shorter than Jason. What makes the record memorable is that after two years of solid hits, we're finally seeing Kylie move away from the little bogan princess with the nasally voice into being a mature pop singer. And look at the singer she is now. Look at her now. Mm. More terribleness at number three. Went and grouped the world. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear, dear. More terribleness at number three. When the group the world needed less than any other group before, the Travelling Wilburys, check in with Handle With Care. While there is a massive plus to the song insofar as Roy Orbison's glorious voice dominates, which is always welcome. There's just a sense that this and the rest of the band's output is a bunch of guys who've written and sung much better songs, showing the results of 15 minutes work. In a lot of ways it typifies this week's top 10 in radio in general. Everything ground down to some bland, dusty pabulum designed to fit into however many slots the now nationwide radio networks deem to require. I'm not sure if things got better or worse at number 2 as a Womack and a Womack spent a second week there with Teardrops, a song with no discernible melody, a beat that is little more than a persistent thump, and no singular aspect to the performance that in any way compels you to remember it the minute it stops playing, although it might be said the lead vocal is strong if only you could hear more of it. I guess it's an early example of the new phenomenon of the club hit, the record that has no translation outside the context of the environment in which it's designed to be heard. That's an interesting theory, but it doesn't account for why this record sold 10 million copies. Some interesting trivia. Womack and Womack are Cecil Womack, who was a member of the Valentinos, who had the original hit with It's All Over Now, a Rolling Stones staple. And Linda Womack was the daughter of the legendary Sam Cooke. The top 10 this week has been pretty depressing. It's been very corporate, very bland, very overproduced, very sanitized. And that's pretty bad, but it's not as bad as it gets. As professional traveling Wilbury Bob Dylan once said, bury that rag deep in your face, for now is the time for your tears, because it's time to reveal the number one record. Kokomo by the Beach Boys. As I mentioned in TRB 22, there is no band that has built a richer legacy yet managed to tear it down more utterly than the Beach Boys. The band had four US number one hit singles, the essential summer party songs in I Get Around and Help Me Rhonda, the brilliantly designed and executed, one of the most brilliantly designed and executed pop singles ever in Good Vibrations, and 1989's Kokomo. Spot the odd one out amongst those four. Clearly riding the coattails of whatever vicarious popularity it could garner from being associated with the Tom Cruise vehicle, the boys 
slugged through an overly sweetened confection which is an ode to a place that doesn't actually exist. Odious goblin Mike Love, who never met an unearned royalty check he didn't like, shoehorned himself a writer's credit for working in the litany of Caribbean port names, including Port-au-Prince, of which the person with even the most rudimentary knowledge of geopolitics most certainly does not want to catch a glimpse. And the whole mucky mush went out in advance of the movie where it sat, rightfully ignored for a few months before taking off with the film. The only reason this doesn't score as lowly as 1927 is because Carl Wilson's voice appears on it. There we have it, the Australia Day week of 1989. For me, this was a completely unmemorable and in points despicable collection. But then I, I had next to zero investment in Top 40 Radio at this point, and that had been diminishing rapidly over the past few years. But what about you? Where were you in 1989? Who were you in 1989? Were you even born in 1989? Share with the room the merits or shortcomings of this week's selection. All that is left to be said is to thank you for coming. Feel free to like, subscribe or berate me in comments. And we'll see you back next week, I hope, for hopefully a better week's worth of music in the next instalment of The Past is a Foreign Country.